there are times in my life, um, like everybody, we always deal with things that come up, right? Like crises, uh, problems, things like that. And there are times in my life when something goes on, my gut reaction is I need an adult. Like I, I need uh, someone who is uh, mature and responsible. I need an adult in my life to help me deal with this. So I need someone to come and help me out. Like that is, that's what I need. I, I need an adult. And that's when I get terrified because I realize with the horror that comes from reality that I am the adult. I'm the one in charge. I'm the one who has to adult. I have to do the hard things even if I don't want to. I have to at times be the calm little center of the universe, making sure that everyone else is fine regardless of what I have going on or not. That's when I stop whining and I get my stuff together. See, one of the things I get asked uh, as a, a there's just so many titles for pastor, minister, teaching elder, minister of word and sacrament, reverend. And everyone always asks, is it pastor or reverend? And my response is always, just don't call me late for dinner. Each title, though, pastor or reverend, carries a different weight to it. They mean different things. One is more formal. One is not. One is something that you have to earn through diligence and study, and one is something that you can take upon yourself. I understand that. I, I appreciate that because I believe that titles need to carry weight with them. That that weight of a title carries with it an expectation. And it means that you have something that you need to live up to. If I have you call me pastor, I need to act like a pastor. If I have you call me reverend, I need to act like a reverend. It becomes a goal, the title. Even something silly as being the adult. Every title we have creates a goal. And that, in my opinion, is why these titles exist. Mr. Miss, Junior, Reverend, doctor, doctor, reverend, pastor, that jerk down the road. All these things are titles that we give to people and people give to us. And with it, we carry the weight of the expectation of what that means. And there should be no heavier title in any follower of Christ's life than Christian. Paul is addressing this notion in the reading from Ephesians this morning. Jesus once told his followers that he, Jesus, is the light of the world. And Paul is echoing this sentiment. Once, before encountering Jesus, they were people who walked in darkness. Now they're different. They are, as Paul will tell the church in Galatia, uh, new creations in Christ. They are called to live as children of the light because that's what they now are. And Paul unpacks what this looks like because it's Paul, and of course he does. He likes to make sure that everything is spelled out as much as he possibly can. And it's very simple. Don't live in the dark. Expose shameful secrets and actions so that they can be dealt with easily. I can't go to a doctor for an issue if I don't know what's going on. If I don't know what's hurt, I can't help. If I don't know what's wrong, I can't help. Keeping secrets is not always the best thing that we could do, especially when they are shameful secrets when they are secrets that can cause us pain. Something that could be dealt with very easily. But we don't want to face those. We don't like to do the, the hard work of looking at the shadow of our souls. Paul goes on to tell them, live your life as a public display of Christ's light in the world. 
And the passage this morning ends with a bit of worship. This is a call to testimonial worship. That's what this passage is. Sleeper, awake, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Go, therefore, and shine your light in the world. In short, Paul tells them, act like it. Get your stuff together and act like it. If you're going to be called a Christian, a word which, when broken down, literally means Christ-like, if you're going to be one of the children of the light, then you better act like it. It just makes sense. If you're going to take on that mantle and that weight, then you need to live into it. If you don't want the title, don't take it. It's easy. It's not one that is being forced on anyone. But if you're going to call yourself a Christian, and if you're going to do what you can to reflect Christ's light in the world, then do it. Stop living in the dark. Stop deluding yourself and others and be the light of Christ in the world. Or rather, be the change you want to see in the world. If you really want the world to be a better place, then act like you're working towards it. I mean, I think that that's something everybody wants, right? I feel like everybody wants the world to be a nicer, kinder, gentler place. And we bemoan and we fret, oh, why isn't it like this? Where is God in the midst of all of this, all of the pain, all of the suffering? How can we even begin to be a joyful, light-filled people if God is not around? And the answer is that God is around. Because you're there. Way back in the beginning of the Bible, in the first book of the Bible in Genesis, it says what exactly? that humanity was created in God's image, which means that every living being on this planet, especially humans, reflect God's glory. You were created as a signpost pointing to God. It doesn't matter if you ever glorify God with your words or actions or not, by your very existence and your very being, that's what you do. So, What's preventing us from taking it further? What is preventing us from being the children of the light? The fact of the matter is that you likely could very well be the only sermon that a person ever hears about Jesus Christ. And I don't mean that you have to get up and preach the gospel or anything. No, it's just your life, your words, your actions. People will look at you and say, if this is a Christian, then that's what it means to be a Christian. And I've seen this. And I know that I've seen it because I have talked to people. I have dined with people who don't even necessarily believe in God. I said, well, why? Because in my mind, like, it makes sense, right? I said, well, it's because when I look at people who call themselves Christians, I don't see Jesus. And that's a shame. That's a shame. So we just let this notion go on and slide because it's someone else's job to lead a person to Jesus. It is. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is what draws people to God. But here's a question for you. How is that job accomplished? Us. It's simple. If you want to call yourself a Christian, then act like it. If you want to be people who lead others to Christ, then act like it. It's ironic that in order to let our light shine, we need to be blind. Light does a lot of things that are needed, right? <clears throat> you need light to see. And there's no greater feeling in the world than when you have a little bit of light in a dark room because then your eyes can adjust quicker and you can actually see what's going on. 
We need to be like the blind man in the text from John this morning. This very long passage is comical and sad and thought-provoking all at the same time. Jesus revealed the truth to this man. He was shown light. Literally, that's the metaphor that Jesus is using here. He even says, I am the light of the world. He says that. And so, in order for the blind man to see, he then has to be exposed to the light. Makes sense. We've been in a dark room before. We know how this works. We know what light does. And after he does this, he heals the man, allowing the man to see because of the light. And that's important. The whole thing starts by the disciple saying, okay, is it his fault that he was born blind or is it his parents' fault? Because, of course, humans want to micromanage sin. They want to know exactly all the ins and outs. They want to know exactly how far they can tow the line and not get in, like, that much trouble. And he just says, no, the guy was blind because he's going to show God's glory. And I don't think that Jesus was just talking about the healing here. Because, yeah, that was great. But what happens next kind of is this comedy of errors almost. The blind man is literally changed in a literal, physical, and metaphorical sense. And then immediately what happens is that people say, oh, yeah, that's the guy. He, wait, he was blind and now he can see. And someone's like, no, that can't be him. People born blind don't get to see. And so then naturally, of course, the Pharisees get wind of this, and they get all up in a tizzy and an uproar because they're like, it's the Sabbath. We should be relaxing and doing no work because we have to follow the rules. And if we don't follow the rules to the T, we're not being the good people that God wants us to be. And so they ask him, they say, how do you see? He said, "Um, Jesus made mud, uh, put it on my eyes, and told me to go wash and I did, and now I see. It's really simple. It's a simple story, and, and it has this like physical component, and I think that in part that physical component was there because the guy he was healing was born blind. He has no business seeing, like he can't see. He has no frame of reference for anything. And so to do this physical work, like Jesus could have just said, boom, healed, eyes open, easy like that. But no, what he does is, He physically comes to the person and touches him and heals him. It's done out of love and respect for the guy. And so the Pharisees talk to him and they ask him who he is. And he says, well, he's a prophet. And the Pharisees are having a problem with this because they're like, he can't be a prophet because by our margins, he's a horrible sinner. But people who are horrible sinners can't do great things for God. That's what the thought was. And so they didn't believe the guy. And so then they call his parents because they want to verify the story. This is fact-checking before Facebook, if you will. And they said, is this your son? Yeah. Was he born blind? Absolutely. Then why can he see now? I don't know. Ask him. Like, he's an adult. He can tell you. Now, part of that is because of this fear that's expressed, because if people follow Jesus, they're going to be kicked out of the Messiah. But I also feel like it's just a statement of fact. Like, he is a grown man. Go ask him. Why are you bothering us? Like, he can speak for himself. And so they go to the man again because they didn't believe him. So he's seen by people outside. Some people believed, some people didn't. He was questioned by the people, like by the Pharisees. They didn't believe him. They questioned his parents. They don't believe them. And now they're going to question him again. And they demand, they said, we know this man is a sinner. Give God glory. Denounce him because there's no way he could have done the thing that you said he did. And he says, I don't know whether he's a sinner or not. I just know that, like, I couldn't see, and now I can see. So what did he do? How did he open your eyes? I done told you already. There was mud, touched my eyes, bathing in the pool. Now I can see. This is not rocket science. This is a very simple story. But they want to know and make sure. They said, why do you, he said, why do you want to know? 
Do you want to follow him too? And then that's when the fight comes because then they kick him out. They drive him out because, oh, he's following Jesus and Jesus isn't a good person. And the blind guy's like, I really don't care. Like if this is, the, if this is your church, if this is how you're going to do things here, I'm just going to leave because this is not right. And so he goes and he finds Jesus again. And Jesus asked him, so you believe in the Son of Man, right? Because everyone knows the Messiah is coming. He said, yeah, I do. Who is he? I want to I know so that I can follow him. And Jesus tells him, it's me. Hi. You've seen him. And that's a beautiful notion. Because it's not even just that he heard Jesus' voice, but he's like, you've seen him. And the weight that that carries from the backstory, knowing he was born blind, is absolutely beautiful and breathtaking. It came into this world for judgment, so that those who do not see may see, and those who do see may become blind. And the Pharisees are like, we can see, like we have the books, like we know what we're supposed to do and everything. And Jesus is like, if you were blind, there wouldn't be a problem. If you were blind, you would not have sin. But now that you say we see, your sin remains. Because if you know something and you're still not doing it, shame on you. They do everything they can to try to wrap their heads around how this guy was healed. And they miss the simple fact of the matter that Jesus did it. Because they're so hung up on not wanting to be like those people, you know, the ones following Jesus. They're so hung up on not wanting to do that, that they just harass a guy who lived his whole life blind and now can see, which must be terrifying in and of itself. I was like, what is that big animal over there? That's a cow. Those are cows? They're delicious. It's ironic. It's ironic because the people who should get it are the ones who don't get it. And that's problematic. The religious elite of the time didn't understand. They should know. They should understand. When they look at Jesus, they should say, okay, everything's starting to line up here. T's are being crossed, I's are dotted, all of that stuff. And yet, it's not. There's this disconnect. Because they're so wrapped up in themselves. You have to understand the power and the social structure of what's going on here. They're the religious elite. They have a lot of power and authority. Yes, they are ruled by Rome, but still, in the local area, they're the leaders of the church. And if they're the leaders of the church and everyone goes to church, they have power and authority. They're not going to want to do something to lose that. And that makes sense. Now, the man born blind gets it. He gets it because he saw the light of Christ. He's been changed. He's been transformed. Because that's the thing about Jesus. When you're exposed to Christ's power, when you're exposed to Christ's light, something has got to change. And the thing that should change is you. And so in the face of this opposition, in the face of being kicked out of the synagogue, in the face of his parents now facing issues and, and trials because of him, he does the only thing that he can do, which is worship God and proclaim Christ as Messiah. It was not popular. It was not safe for him to do it. And yet that is what he did. He made a choice. I have seen the light. I understand the way that the world actually works now, and now I have to reflect that light on the world. Because if this does this for me, imagine what it could do for other people. And we are called to do the same. And it will be hard. It's always hard to follow Christ. They didn't make it easy for Jesus. Why would they make it easy for us? And in fact, Jesus even says, they will hate you because they hated me first. It should not be controversial to act and talk like Jesus, and yet for some reason it is. So yeah, it's going to be hard. Yes, 
You will come up against opposition. You will have people try to stop you. That's what we have to do. And we have to do it no matter what. What's the plaque say? It's for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Because that makes sense. Because we know. And once you know something, you are inevitably changed by that fact. So go. Let your light shine. It doesn't matter if people like darkness or not. You are a child of light. So go. Shine on, you crazy diamond. Amen.